Welcome everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to the BioExcel webinar number 70. Today, the speaker of today, Alexander Bonven from the University of Utrecht. Alexander will speak about the new modular version of ad hoc and he will cover the virtual research environment, integrative modeling and molecular complex. I'm hosting this webinar. I'm Alessandra Villa from the Royal Institute of Technology. And with me is Otto Anderson from the Finnish IT Center for Science. So the webinar is recorded. And you have the possibility to ask questions using the Q&A function that you find at the bottom of the Zoom application depending on which Zoom application you have. So, sorry, depending on which operating system you have, you might have this symbol or you might have this symbol. You just click on the symbol and you write down your question. Then you can tell us if you have or not a microphone. So if you want us to read the question for you, just write no microphone. If you want to read to tell the question yourself, after the webinar, we will unmute you so you can ask your question. But please tell us that you have a question in the Q&A function. For the future, if you have any question about BioXL activity, you can go to askbioxcel.eu. So something about Alexander. So Alexander Bonven studied chemistry at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. He got his PhD at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. And after two years of postdoc in Wales and after ATH in Zurich, he joined Utrecht University. And he got, he was appointed full professor of computational structural biology in 2009. In 2006, he received a prestigious grant from the Dutch Research Council called Vici. And since September 2019, he's scientific director of the Bifoot Center for Molecular Research. He's participating in several European projects, including BioXL and the European Open, Open Science Cloud AGI ISA project. His work has resulted in over 250 peer review publication. So now I am curious to listen about what he will tell us. Okay. Okay, thank you for the introduction, Alessandro. Let me share my screen. Okay, well, it's my pleasure today to tell you about uh, developments around ad hoc and in particular ad hoc free, the new modular version of ad hoc, which has been developed under BioXL and still is being developed under BioXL. And our work in the context of a collaboration with the Dutch eScience Center um, to build a virtual research environment around um, ad hoc and especially ad hoc free in that case. So I'm going to give you a general introduction uh, on the topic, um, and then I will move into the new modular version of ad hoc, ad hoc free. We had previous uh, BioXL webinar about that, and I will uh, show you where we are going with the virtual research environment that we are building on ad hoc free. So why ad hoc? Ad hoc has been uh, developed for over 20 years by now uh, <clears throat> as a tool to study biomolecular interactions basically the social network of proteins as interactions regulate everything in our lives. So what you are seeing here is the center of Utrecht, the city where uh, uh, the ad hoc team is based with a lot of interaction taking place at the macromolecular uh, level between people sitting at those nice terraces on the water side. But of course, everything that happens here is governed at a microscopic level by interactions between biomolecules. And this is what ad hoc has been aiming at since the early days to be able to build models of those complexes of the underlying assemblies, uh, making use as much as possible of experimental data, of experimental knowledge or bioinformatic data to guide the modeling process. So we started from NMR data that are pinpointing the binding sites on the surface of proteins 
and move to biochemical data, cross-linking data, HD exchange, bioinformatics, uh, even prior OEM and small angle X-ray scattering. And Haddock since the early days has been also able to model uh, complexes that consist of more than two molecules. That's also an, an important aspect to, to realize that many assemblies have, have multiple components and those components can also be of various types. So protein, nucleic acid, small molecule, oligosaccharides. So Haddock can handle all of those. Classically, the Haddock workflow uh, consists of a static uh, path with three main steps. An initial step, which consists of uh, rigid body energy minimizations, where the molecules are basically brought together by energy minimization using the data uh, at hand to drive the modeling process. Then we have a flexible refinement stage, which we call IT1 in ad hoc context, where we introduce flexibility at the interface of the molecule to uh, model small conformational changes. And we used to have a final refinement stage in explicit solvent in water to do a, a final refinement and improve a bit the energetics. So to all of these stages uh, are associated uh, scoring functions or when we are speaking of modeling complexes, we distinguish between the sampling, the generation of models, and the scoring, which is basically the ranking of those models to identify the best uh, uh, model. Uh, now, those functions that we're using for the ranking, the scoring functions are very simple. Uh, these are, of course, these days you will call these machine learning models, but these are simple linear models uh, that were developed 20 years ago and are still making a good job at uh, uh, doing the ranking. So you see there are different components of those. So at different stages during the protocol, we have a slightly different uh, uh, function which we are using. Uh, and this will be the classical function that we use at the end of the protocol, um, which consists of intermolecular energetic components between the molecule, the green energy term, so electrostatic and Van der Waals interactions, a dissolvation energy term. This is an empirical term that accounts for the price or the bonus that you get by removing water from the interface. And the final term, which we call air for ambiguous interaction restraints, describe basically the component of the energy that comes from the experimental or bioinformatic predictions that we put into the modeling process. Now, this sounds very classical and in these days of AI and machine learning, maybe naive, but it's still a hard uh, function to beat. We are also, of course, working um, on developing better scoring functions and better models, and we have uh, developed uh, DeepRank and DeepRank GNN, which is a graph-based neural network, so deep learning model uh, to rank complexes. That's not something which is yet integrated into uh, the current version of ad hoc, but that's going to uh, come integrated into ad hoc free, the modular version. Uh, still, even AI has a hard time to beat those, those classical simple energy functions. One advantage of this is that this is uh, working for a variety of complexes. So you might have protein, protein, protein peptide, protein small molecule, protein nucleic acid interfaces within the large complex that you're modeling. And we're using one function uh, pretty much to, to score all interfaces at the same time. While the AI models are usually trained for a very specific class of complexes, meaning that if you have a large assembly consisting of different types of molecule, you might have to combine multiple AI models if you can train them to score all the different interfaces. So the classical uh, use of Haddock has been through the year for uh, our web services, uh, which has been operating since 2008. So we have uh, 15 years of providing services to the community. So the current production version is uh, Haddock 2.4, uh, which runs the static workflow. So users come, upload their data, can tweak the parameters, but they cannot really change the, the workflow which is run. So since uh, the first uh, uh, days of uh, the Haddock server in 2008, uh, we have, uh, have more than 37,000 users that have registered for, for using the portal. Of course, they are not all active. Um, uh, some, and then some come back after a long period, some uh, come very shortly for a project and we never see them back. And those users have served over half a million uh, docking runs since 2008. Now we are able to do all of this and to provide those services because we have access to the European Open Science Cloud high throughput compute resources, uh, grid computing, uh, which are provided to us with the support of EGI. 
And because of that, uh, uh, we have access actually to over 100 CPU cores distributed around Europe mainly, but also Asia and even the US. Now, just a, a few notes. Uh, this is uh, showing you some statistic of, uh, of the usage of the web service, the Hadoop web service uh, since 2020. And you see uh, something happened at the beginning of 2020. We all went into lockdown because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And uh, people who could no longer do experiments realized that maybe modeling and computing uh, tools were interesting to still do uh, some work. And so we had almost a tripling of the number of uh, submission to the server early 2020. And, and this has been going on quite stable over the year, uh, since the uh, last two years. We see peak in this distribution. And this seems related to some extent to appearance of new variants of the virus. And the orange bar that you see in the left plot are indicating the fraction of those submissions which corresponds to COVID-19 uh, related research projects. So we have quite a sustained uh, use of the services to model uh, uh, COVID related uh, complexes. Now, this increased usage of the complex is also reflected in the number of unique users per month. So a unique user will be a user that submit at least one docking run to the server. Um, and you see that this has increased again 2020. So the COVID-19 effect here uh, more than doubles and we have a stable uh, usage of the server. So we are not seeing yet uh, in, the, in those statistics the impact of uh, AI, AlphaFold, uh, which are, of course, now also providing fantastic tools to predict structure of protein-protein complexes. Uh, but there's clearly still a need um, for tools like Haddock that have a more classical approach to the problem and support different types of, of complexes and molecules. Now, this was uh, my general introduction, so let's move now into uh, Haddock 3. So Haddock uh, version 3 is a complete rewrite of uh, uh, Haddock 2 series, where we have basically been breaking the code into modules. And uh, this uh, gives much more flexibility to what we can do in terms of workflows. So this has been the work uh, so the, the, since 2019 under BioXL uh, 2, the second uh, round of the BioXL Center of Excellence, we have been developing Haddock 3. And this has been the work over the years of Rodrigo, Brian, Joao, and Marco with Rodrigo and Marco still being part of the team in, in Utrecht. So what we did basically is to move from the static workflow where you have to go through all those three stages and you can tweak parameters, but not the workflow to basically a, a modular workflow architecture. So we broke the Haddock code into a catalog of independent modules. And this allows us to mix and match those modules to generate different workflows. So here is another workflow, which consists of more modules. And this gives much more flexibility to the type of scenarios that you can run with Haddock. Uh, this uh, modularization of Haddock has also come to a price because we have been stripping down some functionalities. So the current Haddock free code support anything that can be translated into uh, distant restraints. But at this time, the capabilities for cryoEM based restraints and uh, cause draining, for example, have not yet been implemented in Haddock 3. So this is something that we intend to re-implement in the future. Now, what are the modules that are currently available? So first of all, we have a topology module where you build basically your system. This will build any missing atoms, generate the parameters and topologies to do the computations. We have sampling modules. So these are modules that will allow you to generate models of your complexes if you start from uh, separate molecules. So the rigid body module is the, the classical ad hoc, what we used to call IT0. But we also integrated here two third party software, uh, which also allow you to do a sampling. So LightDoc, developed by Brian Jimenez and uh, Jorge Hulturis, is integrated into the ad hoc free uh, uh, module library. And GDoc from uh, Rodrigo is actually a genetic algorithm based uh, docking approach. So we have more flexibility in what we are using in a sampling stage. The refinement modules, so we have the semi-flexible refinement module, which is the classical IT1 stage of Haddock uh, 2 series. Energy minimization, which will be the final stage of Haddock uh, uh, refinement in, uh, in the current server, or uh, final refinement with explicit solvents, which is uh, 
which was the default in a ad hoc 2.2 version. Uh, in terms of refinement, we also are currently working on an OpenMM module, which you can connect uh, into your workflow. So it's not yet part of the main branch of ad hoc 3, but uh, uh, we hope to be able to release that one uh, also soon. So we have um, also scoring modules where uh, you might just want to, you have a complex, you don't want to generate the complex, but you just want to calculate some uh, ad hoc score, possibly do a short minimization or short molecular dynamic system, uh, molecular dynamic simulation of your system. So we have uh, what we call here EM scoring and MD scoring. And we build a lot of analysis modules uh, that gives a lot of flexibility and also in the workflow. So one of which is this Capri evaluation module. So if you have a reference structure, this will calculate all the Capri um, uh, metrics uh, like uh, interface RMSD, ligand RMSD, DOCQ score. So uh, these are standard metrics that we use in the field to evaluate the quality of the prediction. Of course, this only uh, you will on, you can only do that if you know the reference structure. If you don't have a reference structure, what Capri Eval will do is to calculate all those metrics with respect to the best model generated by Haddock. And this allows us to generate in the post-processing stage of Haddock 3, all kinds of plots. I'm going to illustrate that in a bit. Um, that allows you to visualize the results in the same way that the Haddock server is actually showing you the results, but not uh, from a local installation of Haddock. So you can do also clustering, by using a uh, root mean square deviation based clustering metrics or clustering by fraction of common contact, uh, clustering by RMSD, selection of models. So this is kind of a scoring module where you tell I want to select the top 200 model or you might do clustering and then select the top clusters for further processing. And we are actually also working on a deep rank module which will bring our, our, our AI based uh, scoring module into ad hoc free. Uh, the definition of the workflow is quite simple in this model. So it's a simple TOML file, uh, text-based ASCII file, which uh, describe here where you see a short example. So this particular workflow consists of, uh, uh, now I have to do some counting, nine modules. So the topo A1 is the building the topology. These are the input data that we provide. And then we have the rigid body module uh, where the default sampling is 1000. In this case, we select the best 200 model, which we give to the flexible refinement and a final EM ref. We calculate some Capri metrics, uh, do clustering based on a fraction of contact, select the best clusters and evaluate the quality of the clusters with a Capri eval. So that's a very simple workflow. Also compared to the previous version of ad hoc, what is also important to note is that the restraints are defined per module. In the ad hoc 2 series, the restraints were defined for the entire workflow. So you could not change the type of restraints easily between different steps of your workflow. Now we define the restraints for each module. So this gives you also more flexibility in the type of data and uh, the type of restraints that you might want to include or not at different stage of the workflow. So this is all uh, uh, open and uh, freely accessible from the GitHub uh, ad hoc free repository. And uh, this is a small uh, timeline history of the development. So what you see basically since the early day 2019, the code evolved from the old Haddock code. Uh, and there's a lot of things happening here, but you see the uh, appearance of all the, 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 you see workflow here in the center appearing. So this is the core machinery of Haddock 3. You see now the some of the modules appearing in this site. Uh, test benchmarking data appearing. So this is now, we are now uh, 2020, um, in the, well in the middle of BioXL2. Uh, every time that you see lines or the, something happening, there are commits. So you see that there are some major uh, commits to the, to the code, which is constantly evolving. <clears throat> and slowly it is converging uh, uh, to, to what is uh, I would say a pre-release version. So we still don't have the official release yet, but we hope uh, soon to have an official release. But again, you, uh, we have several versions that are uh, tagged on the, on the GitHub site. And if you uh, clone the main version, you always get the latest version of Haddock. So here you see things are now converging. You find here the different module, the machinery around the world for the workflow engine and everything. And here you see more the analysis data and some of the... Uh, over part of, of the code. And this is where we stand uh, in June, 2023. Now, how to run ad hoc? 
For Haddock 2, most of our users are using the web services, which we are providing. Uh, currently, Haddock 3, basically, you have to run it from the command line. So you will call Haddock, you will install Haddock first, and you will call it with a TOML file, which I just shortly described. This is going to generate a result folder, and in that folder, you will find the different stages of your workflow, numbered based on the, on the workflow uh, steps that you defined. Uh, in terms of execution modes, uh, so you have a, a free execution modes currently supported, so local, meaning that uh, Haddock 3 will use your local resources to uh, execute the, the different jobs, the different part of the workflow. Each model in principle, which is generated is a simple, is a separate uh, uh, computing load. Um, so mode local, we just run on, you know, on your laptop, or you could run mode local on, on a full node of an HPC system. You define the number of cores. It will limit the number of cores to the maximum number of cores available on the system. We also have an HPC mode. So this is, these are these, these running modes are basically configured in the TOML file that you give to Haddock. Then we have this high performance computing mode where we are currently supporting Slurm and Torque as batch system. So the compute mode in this case will be HPC. You can define the queue uh, to which you want to submit. Uh, if the queue is defined, the default by, uh, will be used. Uh, since uh, you don't want the jobs that you submit to the queue to be too short because this is um, increasing the load on the batch system, so we are we can concatenate multiple models into one job sent to the batch system. So in this example, we're going to calculate five models per job sent to the batch system, and then you can also define the number of concurrent submissions to the queue to your batch system, which is in this example is 250. Now, the third mode that we have implemented, and this is news, this was not available in the ad hoc 2 series, is uh, NPI, so parallel execution mode. Uh, and in this example, we uh, request uh, 250 cores. And of course, the allocation of node will have to be done by the batch system. So now you have some, or you have to start NPI run, or you configure your, your, your job that you sent your batch system to request the number of nodes and the number of core per nodes to match what you're going to define here. So this now allows us to, to scale uh, ad hoc to larger number of nodes. And we did some uh, initial testing. This is very much work in progress, but we did some initial testing. And here we are doing a sampling of uh, say 10,000 rigid body models and we are refining more than 2,000. So those numbers are matching the number of cores. So we are claiming all the cores of one node. The, this experiment was done at the Dutch supercomputer in Amsterdam called Snenius. And basically, you see the, uh, the time, the, basically the, the workflow time. This is the wall clock time to execute this kind of, of sampling. If you run onto one node, 128 cores, and then uh, so about 140 minutes, uh, you go uh, to about 70 minutes if you request two nodes, and you see that then this flats down. Now, this will be the speed up factor. So the orange line will be the ideal speed up. So we go from one node to 16 node in this case. And this is the number of corresponding processors. So ideal will be you know, full, full scaling. Uh, if you run the entire workflow, uh, you see that we are reaching about, uh, we are above the 50, 60% uh, performance on 16 nodes. And where we are losing is that within the workflow, we have steps that are. Uh, uh, selection, ranking, and these are not distributed steps, but these are sequential steps. And this is slowing down uh, the, the workflow. If you consider only the compute intensive step of the workflow, like the rigid body sampling or the flexible refinement, you see here that the scanning is much higher. So, so the, the non-compute intensive step of the workflow are basically decreasing your scaling. Still, uh, we get a very nice uh, speed up. So, also to facilitate the, the use of ad hoc, if you want to run a large number of, uh, of simulation, um, Rodrigo has developed the ad hoc runner, which is basically a tool which you can find on our uh, GitHub repository. So ad hocing ad hoc runner. Uh, it supports ad hoc 2.4, ad hoc 2.5. 2.5 is the same version of ad hoc 2.4, basically same functionalities, but this is a Python free port of, uh, of ad hoc. The server still runs 2.4. Uh, but the functionality is exactly the same. And we're going to upgrade the server probably later this year or next year to run uh, to five. But it also allows you to run ad hoc free uh, workflows. Uh, 
you configure the runner uh, in YAML files that are basically to define the standard scenarios that you want to run. So you might say, I want to run different scenarios, different workflows. And in there, you're also going to define the data that you want to run. So, um, so it, uh, it does not distribute the, the different uh, docking runs that you're going to do uh, in parallel, but it's going to execute all of them. And then the distribution will be taken care of by, by the by ad hoc engine itself. Uh, but it's, it's really uh, nice for uh, uh, automation and reproducibility of, uh, of computing. So if you're interested to run a large number of, of docking runs, uh, take a look at the ad hoc runner. This is not uh, usable to submit large number of jobs to the server, for example. This is meant to be used with the standalone version of ad hoc. And here are some examples of the configuration files. So you see a configuration for ad hoc 2.4 on the left side, where there are two scenarios shown here. One will be a true interface. So we have the perfect knowledge of which residues are at the interface. And we define here only the parameters that we might want to change compared to the default parameters. Uh, and another scenario will be a center of mass. This will be an abidicio mode of, of ad hoc, where you define, you see that some service parameter, the sampling is increased in this case. Uh, on the right side, you see a scenario for ad hoc free um, workflow. Again, so this is a true interface scenario where you have general parameters, which define the, the, the running mode. In this case, it's HPC. We define the, the workflow. The module I defined here, so this is a workflow consisting of seven steps, basically in this case. And then for each of those steps, you find here uh, parameters that are specific to it. To use the Haddock runner, you have to have a very consistent naming of, uh, of files. Um, and this is all explained in the documentation online. So if you're interested, uh, look it up. Mm. Now, here is one example workflow. So this is a workflow which would not have been possible to run in the current ad hoc 2.x uh, version of the code. And this is uh, a workflow we are using now to model an antibody antigen complex. By the way, AlphaFold is doing very poorly for this type of complexes, so they are still need for more classical software. Uh, using as information the knowledge of the hyperviable loops on the antibody and the full surface on the antigen. So we have no information on the antigen where things are binding, so we target the entire surface. So the workflow in this case consists of 12 stages. Um, we have added, you see that there are several capri eval stages, which is just for uh, being able to, to see the distribution of energy versus RMSD. So this is more for analysis purposes. If you want to be efficient, you will probably only introduce a capri eval stage at the end of your workflow. So again, we build topology, do rigid body docking, sampling of 10,000 models. Actually, the sampling is 100,000, but we write to this 10,000 model. And in ad hoc 2, you will make a selection of the top few hundred models and give that to the flexible refiner. So here we do something different. So we're doing clustering using fast uh, the fraction of common contact. And this is a fast method to cluster models, which allows us to cluster 10,000 models. Then we select all the cluster that have at least a population of four members. And we select a maximum of 20 models per cluster. In this example, uh, this results in a selection of about 200 clusters. Uh, so we're going to give 20 model max per cluster. Some cluster will have a smaller size. And we passed all those clusters to the flexible refinement and to the final uh, energy minimization refinement. We do a final clustering, and then we score the entire, uh, we assess the entire results using the capri eval module. Now, here is an example of, uh, of what this does. So because we put a Capri eval module after the rigid body sampling, we uh, had to generate these kind of plots for us directly. So you see here the sampling. Uh, this is the doc Q score. So the doc Q score, if it's above uh, 0.23, if I'm correct, and you have a solution which is of acceptable quality, and uh, this uh, one will be perfect quality. So the solution that you see here above 0.7 are already very high quality models that are generated. But if you look where they are, they are not yet in a perfect region of the ad hoc score. So if you are to select using the old ad hoc 2 recipe, where we select a few hundred models, there's a high chance that you only pick up models in these regions and you lose those ones. Those models, however, do cluster. And by selecting all the clusters that are sample at this stage and passing them to the refinement stage, you see that at the end of the run, so this is the final analysis of the results, 
uh, this cluster, which was here, is now here, and it's scoring now as one of the uh, top 10 cluster in this ex in particular example. Again, this is something which would not have been possible in a previous version of ad hoc, but which is now possible in this modular version. So all of this is, uh, of course, uh, so far common line with some plot generation. And uh, now I'm going to describe you the work uh, that we are doing uh, in building a virtual research environment to uh, for Hadoc 3, which will provide basically a graphical interface to the software. So the plan that we uh, wrote and uh, that we are now basically uh, executing together with the eScience Center was to have uh, different components. So, so, so this uh, virtual research environment will consist of three main components. The first one will be the being the Hadoc workflow builder. So the idea is that uh, <clears throat> The user can come to this uh, interface with his own data, uh, select from a module directory, so all the modules supported by Haddock, and in an interactive way, build the workflow uh, that he wants, she wants to execute and adapt the parameters that are related to the module. So this will define the workflow. What we also want to have here is a, a database uh, to store workflows so, we, so that we can provide different scenarios up front so user can select from pre-existing scenarios. But we also want users in, at the end to be able to upload their own workflows because they might have devised a workflow which might be interesting for something else. So we have to, this database of community workflow for sharing and making the workflow uh, uh, fair also. Now, once you have defined your workflow and you have set all your parameters, this will go into uh, the execution middleware, <clears throat> which will support different execution modes. So it could be local, could be HPC connecting to your local cluster, uh, could be uh, connecting to the cloud or to the grid. Um, I'm going to come back to that in a bit. And at the end, you will get your results and this will be fed into uh, an analysis uh, storage and sharing infrastructure, where basically uh, the idea is that you can interactively uh, analyze your, your runs, possibly change some parameters like clustering, provide uh, access to molecular visualization online, interactive growth, and Jupyter and output. So all of this is basically coming together in what we call uh, IVRES. And you see the, the GitHub repository down there, which is uh, uh, open. So this is very much uh, an evolving project, but you can also already look at it and, and you know download the software and play with it where uh, the interface would basically present uh, three components. So the builder, the, the bartender, where the, the execution will take place, and the management system. So uh, the workflow builder first. So here is an example of the workflow builder. Uh, it is dynamically configured based on ad hoc freeze module and definitions and parameters. So basically the workflow builder reads the code so when we add a new uh, module to ad hoc, the workflow, this interface will be automatically updated. Uh, it's not specific to ad hoc. In principle, it's reusable for our software as long as you have the, the same way of, of reading and importing the, the parameters. So it makes it very uh, um, efficient and easy for us if we add parameters, if we change module, add modules, they will automatically appear in a workflow builder. So you see the catalog of modules with different type of modules. And here is a workflow that has been built. You can see in a visual, but if you switch to the text view, then you will see the, the, the TOML file, the simple ASCII file. And it's basically a drag and drop uh, system. And when you click on one of the module on the right side, there's a window that appears with all the parameters that you can configure. There's also different uh, uh, user level. So you can use the, the workflow builder at the easy uh, level so that you don't have, you're not exposed to too many parameters, but you can go also at the advanced level where you see all the possible parameters that you might change. And this is usually quite a lot. Here is a small example uh, of, of uh, uh, building such a workflow. So again, you see here a list of, uh, of modules you can select from. Here is a workflow that has been built. Uh, switching to text and you see hey, again for each modules you can change uh, uh, different parameters and at the end you can download basically the entire uh, uh, data uh, you will download the toml file that allows you to execute the workflow uh, on your system 
<clears throat> what we have also uh, uh, been doing is to uh, provide different tools basically to use this workflow builder. So one of it is an integration into uh, the Galaxy system. So if you go to the GitHub repository of Ibrace, you will also find this code where now in the Galaxy system, you can basically build uh, ad hoc workflows. And we also have uh, an integration in uh, Jupyter Lab, so that uh, with Jupyter notebooks, basically you can uh, build ad hoc workflows. <clears throat> so now the bartender, which is the core of ad hoc, this is what is going basically. Uh, it's it's a back end that's going to schedule the jobs on various infrastructure, and it will also provide the user management and so uh, with social logins and uh, uh, also. Um, single sign-on uh, capabilities. The idea for the bartender, but also for the workflow is that uh, you can also install and configure it on your system. So you can run this uh, interface on your own system. So that's not us providing all the infrastructure, but this is customizable to, to everyone's infrastructure. We hope in the future that we will have an interface running on our servers uh, directly uh, in Utrecht, uh, but we'll have to see about capacity and, and running mode. So uh, basically the bartender is running as a RESTful application where you configure it. So it could be your HPC cluster and it has a number of standard API, which will be uh, queried by the, the interface by the bartender. So this needs to be configured on the system of your choice. So this is an overview of uh, what the bartender is, is supposed to do and look like. So the user upload uh, has defined a workflow. It's going to upload and select the destination. The destination will depend, of course, on what has been configured on, on the back end of the bartender. And currently, we have different uh, modes that are implemented, supported, but these have to be uh, configured. So you see, again, like a high throughput mode slurm. Uh, we are currently working also on the DRAC. So DRAC is a job management system for uh, high throughput computing, which is used on uh, by EGI. This is what is used currently by the ad hoc 2.4 uh, web portal to distribute job loads over these 100,000 CPU cores that we have access to. Um, so of course, here there will be configuration that has put it on to be able to connect to those system, but in principle, the machine really is there. Uh, <clears throat> and then you can run in memory on your own system. So you can even install the bartender in principle on your own laptop. And there's a, a monitoring basically uh, layer in the bartender that is basically monitoring uh, if the jobs are completed or not. And if they are completed, it will basically retrieve the, the data and, and present the results to the user. And the last part is the basically the management and analysis platform. <clears throat> so this will provide the data management analysis and visualization tools. So this builds actually uh, upon uh, plots and analysis, which is performed automatically by ad hoc free. So even when you run a local version of ad hoc free without the IVRES environment, uh, by default, uh, this kind of plots will be generated. And with a simple Python command, you can launch a, a local server and inspect uh, those uh, results uh, through a web browser. So you see here, what you see here is a uh, uh, we present the top 10 clusters. This is what the Haddock 2.4 server is, is showing you as well. The cluster ID size, different metrics, statistics. Um, you also see uh, RMSD. So if you have provided a, a reference structure, this will be with respect to the reference. If you are provide no reference structure, this will be with respect to the best model generated by Haddock. So you get all those statistics, energetics here, and then you can view online in your browser uh, the different models or save them. And we also have these plots. These are the same kind of plots that the server is providing you, but now they are provided by ad hoc free itself. So you don't, we, without the server, you can still uh, analyze your, your results in the same way that you will do when using the ad hoc 2.4 uh, web server. And these are interactive plots. If you hover on the points, it will tell you which model it is, what are its, uh, what's its score, RMSD, and all of that. So I think that's a very useful addition uh, to, to add uh, in ad hoc free, which makes it look and feel much more like the server uh, in ad hoc 2.4. Uh, 
So here are uh, such plots. So you can click on the clusters to make them visible or not. Uh, in this case, we're plotting the RMSD of the interface uh, versus the Haddock score. And this is with respect in this example to a non-reference structure. And here you see a pair cluster, the distribution of scores uh, of the Haddock score. So how will this all look like? So basically there will be a web application uh, which will be the, the bartended haddock. Uh, so this web application, you might run it on your own system or you might connect uh, to the web application that we are going to run uh, uh, from our servers in Utrecht. So this will manage the, the, the login into the system. So we need uh, uh, people will have to, to register to use these tools. Um, then we will use the workflow builder basically to configure the, the workflow and uh, the parameters that we want to run. And the builder, in the context of the bartender ad hoc three, will submit the job to the bartender, which will run them, calling ad hoc three either locally on an HPC system or on the cloud. And it will uh, basically the, the web application will basically monitor then uh, the state of the job. Actually, the bartender is doing that, but the web application will communicate with the bartender to monitor the state of the job. And when it's finished, it will provide the result of the job. So all of this is built on those three components, the builder, the bartender, and then the, the web application, which will provide you the interface to the, the results as well. So all of this is available uh, in our Ivres GitHub repository. And if you know a bit of French, you will understand what Ivres is, and you will see that this is a very nice combination with Haddock, of course. You see here, Haddock in a state of Ivres, I would say. So you see the workflow builder, uh, the bartender is here. Uh, you see here the Haddock free uh, Jupyter Lab uh, implementation and some of the tools uh, that are there. So take a look at this if you're interested. Uh, remember, this is uh, an evolving project, and we still have uh, quite some work to do. So to wrap up things in conclusion, so we are uh, currently finalizing the first production release of Haddock 3. So for now, we still have uh, several beta releases, but uh, we see that the community is picking up. Uh, people are using Haddock 3 already, uh, even contributing to it. So it's nice. So we want to make it really a community effort. So we invite uh, people to, uh, to contribute. We have also in the documentation instruction how to contribute and how to, to build modules. We have now integrated analysis tool inside Haddock 3. Um, and these are now leveraged by VRE, by Ivres, uh, to, to present uh, the result page. But this is also available from the local installation of Haddock 3. And we are uh, very much uh, HTC, high throughput compute, but also HPC oriented because uh, Bar Excel is operating in the context of Euro HPC and where we have to improve. Uh, usability and scalability and performance of our code on, on the next generation of exascale computers. Very much related to all the ad hoc free work in, um, in the context of BioXL is the uh, virtual research environment work uh, for integrative modeling, and the Ivres project, which is run in collaboration with the Dutch eScience Center. So this will provide a user-friendly interface and integrated backend to build, execute, and analyze ad hoc free workflows. And this will be, a, it will be possible to install it locally, but also use our own uh, interface to that one in the future. While currently for ad hoc two, we are running the interface and this is not a code that we are distributing because it's way too complex for that. Uh, we hope to also have uh, provide uh, easy deployment uh, with Docker Compose um, offsite. And the technology behind Ivres actually is generic and can be reused by other projects. So it's not tied to ad hoc. With that, I want to thank the people who have been contributing uh, to the work. So you see some of the current uh, group members here and some of the former members uh, who have contributed to all the ad hoc developments. Uh, especially big thank to Rodrigo, who is uh, Marco, Joao, and Brian, who are the architects of uh, uh, Haddock 3. Rodrigo is also the one who developed the Haddock Runner and is the one who is making sure that our uh, uh, web infrastructure is up and running so that uh, you uh, as users can make use of it. And uh, we also providing all support. 
Uh, Victor joined the team recently. He's the one who is currently working on the OpenMM module, uh, which was a project from a master's student in the past. Xiao Tong is a master's student, and oh, sorry, a PhD student, excuse me, Xiao Tong. Um, and she's the one who is uh, working on implementing or deep rank uh, AI scoring module into ad hoc free. And in the context of BioXL, uh, uh, we hope soon to be uh, hiring uh, two postdocs to contribute to further development. So if you are interested, uh, do contact me and keep your eyes open when those positions will be officially announced. So all of this over the years has been supported, of course, by a funding uh, from national projects, uh, from European projects, with BioXL playing a central role in all of our ad hoc free code development. And I should not forget, of course, to uh, thank also the eScience Center team, uh, who is doing a fantastic work in uh, in the Everest project and building the virtual research environment. So Stefan, Peter, and uh, Sarah, uh, who are contributing a lot to Everest, but also actually to the ad hoc free development itself. With that, I'm finished, and I will be happy to answer any question you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexander. It was great. So maybe there are no Q&A, no question type, but maybe I just activate the chat so people can just uh, uh, raise the, um, sorry, activate the raise hand so they can just uh, raise their hand so they, they can also ask questions in this way, if I can, I, let me see. Well, otherwise just use the Q&A and then uh, write there your question and, uh, and then uh, we will read. Okay. Now you can arise then if you have a question. I can see it. Oh, we okay. have a question. Okay. From Andrea. Wait, that I, I try to unmute Andrea. So, Andrea, now you can ask your question directly if you want. Andrea is not, now he can speak, but he doesn't uh, speak. Okay, we can read the question. Then. I can read the question. Yeah. First of all, amazing work with the new Adobe tree. I have been using Adobe since the version 1.3, and this represents a breaking through in the in protein protein docking in terms of eye flexibility. Do you think to add something based on bioinformatic data? to drive docking when no experiment data are available in this new framework. I mean, I mean, basically, do you think to embed C port and whiskey or similar or similar in ad hoc tree? So this is something, of course, C port has been there also for quite some time as a, as a web service as well. And we have been revisiting it. Uh, so we have now a standalone version of C port. So I think this this will be a logical thing to do. Uh, what we have also been working on, and this was a master project from a visiting student from Italy, Filippo, who has been uh, implementing uh, a co-evolution module, actually. So this is something that will also be interesting to have. Uh, so in principle, we can build uh, a module. So we'll have to see uh, from a workflow perspective, because the module itself will generate data, not per se model, so it means that we might have to branch. So at this time, we can, we don't have yet the machinery to branch the workflow, so it's a, it's a linear workflow, but I think um, these kind of things will be great to have directly as modules. And we, of course, welcome uh, contributions from uh, third parties. Okay, so if someone has a question, can just type in the Q&A or just raise the hand and I will ap approve you to ask, to ask your question. I think it's good to take the chance. Huh? In the meantime, people are thinking Yeah, I don't see things. I can just uh, uh, announce the following webinar. So then we are done. In the meantime, people may think about some question that they have and they can. 
Okay, so that was, let me just, uh, uh, okay. So then uh, uh, the next webinar, it will be next week. So the 20th of June, and it will be about Gromax PMX uh, for an accurate estimation on the free energy difference is from, from Sudar, Sudar Sham Berea from the Max Planck Institute in Gottingen. And the registration is open. Yeah, Andrea went back for, from, with another question. Uh, so he's, uh, he's asking, is the scoring function still a holy grail? As you said once, is ML AI is far away from help us in this terrible task? So I think there is still a, a lot to be done, yes. So if we look at a, a deep rank, and deep rank is being used as uh, as a reference, there are several work that are being published now where you see that deep rank is actually one of the better ones at this time uh, for protein protein complexes. Uh, but it's it still has a hard time in our hands to beat the, the simple ad hoc score. I think some of the advantages for, for this kind of AI models is that they, may, they might be less sensitive when you deal with models that are coming from different software. While our scoring function will, of course, be very sensitive to where the model comes from. So if you use another docking software or like rigid body docking software, ZDoc Plus Pro, uh, which typically have more clashes at the end, uh, our scoring function will probably do quite bad, while the AI one might be more uh, work better. Uh, you see a lot of things happening also in the small molecule world for uh, with AI. So there, there is a lot of scoring functions coming up, which which uh, works quite nicely. I think one of the limiting factor also in all of these are uh, is the availability of data. So if you want to want to train models, you need good data. Uh, so I haven't seen much yet happening for DNA, for nucleic acids, RNA. Uh, maybe we are limited by the number of data, but, but it's, it's coming there as well. So it will come. Uh, the issue is that if you are building systems that consist of multiple types of molecule, uh, there is no yet AI function that can score all different types of molecule at the same time. So you will have to score based on the interface and then find a way of combining all those scores. And that might not be trivial. While if you use more physics-based scoring, then this applies in principle to all interfaces at the same time, which is what we are doing in, in ad hoc. But of course, you know, if AI comes with a very good scoring function and you see, for example, alpha fold uh, can be used uh, as kind of a scoring function, it's a bit expensive. It depends on the number of models that you have to score, but it, it's, it's doable and it's doing quite a good job. So we have to keep our eyes open and uh, and move with all the development that are taking place now. And the field is changing extremely fast. Other question? No? So Andrea was sorry that he cannot speak. So that is, uh, that is not a problem. He was typing. So... Yeah, so I thank you everybody. If there is no question, I thank you a lot, Alexander. It was a great presentation and I thank you all the attendees to be here and see you next time. So I will close this webinar section now. Yeah, bye-bye. Thank you, bye.